Welcome to our program. I'm Keith Thibault from FRC Media. As part of our preparation to help voters get ready for the March 12th recall election, we're spending some time with all the candidates on the ballot. And today, I'm pleased to be joined by the incumbent mayor of Fall River, Mayor Jason Creer. Mayor, thank you for joining nice us. Nice to be here, Keith. I appreciate Happy it. to be here. <laughs> Listen, I want to get to a lot today, yes, so I apologize up it. front if I do some interrupting, but I do want to get to a lot uh, as we speak for the next half Let's hour. Let's do it. Um, as you know, mm -hmm. you are the focus of the recall on March mm -hmm. 12th. The very first part of the ballot are asking residents whether you should be recalled as mm -hmm. mayor. Yes. Briefly, why should people vote no? Oh, geez, briefly? That's a tough <laughs> one, <laughs> of course. So uh, you're absolutely right. There are two parts of this ballot. The first half, I'm asking people vote against. That's the, the word on the ballot, or uh, more commonly referred to as no. And then again at the bottom, voting again for Jaisal Correa II to continue to be the mayor uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the coming months. Uh, but really, it's, it's about the record. I, that's what I ask people to look at. It's about the facts and the record. Um, you know, I've eliminated the purple bag program. I've eliminated the trash fee. I've increased uh, our, our staffing levels in our police and fire department. Uh, I've given more uh, money to our school department for the first time in decades. Uh, we're fixing roads all over the community. You're seeing unprecedented levels of economic development in our south end. Uh, different things like King Philip Mill being, uh, being um, completely, totally transformed. Uh, we've really done so much, and we don't want to change. We don't want progress to slow down. We, won't want, we don't want it to turn around. And that's why I'm asking people to vote no uh, or against the recall and reelect me, Jaisal Correa II, as mayor of the city. All right. That was brief. Perfect. <laughs> we appreciate that. So, Mayor, back, on, um, back last fall when you faced the charges that you're facing in federal court, and we're not going to get into the specifics of the case because we know we can't, we can't speak about it, um, you had mentioned that that was like one of the worst days of, of your life mm. to that point. How have you handled it since then? You've had plenty of time to, to continue to work and yep. continue to serve the city. Keith, uh, this will be behind me very shortly. Um, it'll be totally gone, totally uh, uh, not, a, not a part of my life anymore, and I'm excited for that day, and that day is coming. Um, so, you know, I've been able to continue to do my job each and every single day, whether it's on the school committee as the chairman, whether it's meeting people in the coffee shop, whether it's meeting people on the campaign trail. Uh, I'm doing my job each and every single day, and we've done it at an even higher level. Uh, with me and my team at Government Center. As you know, a lot of people had asked you to resign, and you have every right to say, I'm going to stay on and mm -hmm. fight the challenges, innocent to proven guilty. Mm -hmm. The recall election will help decide some of that in, in either way. But let me ask you this. It, if, if there was a department head that works under you that had faced business charges similar to what you're facing, um, would you ask that individual to resign? And if this person was adamant about saying it was before my time, working for the city, and this was in the past, hmm. would you ask that person to resign? So I work for the people of the city of Fall River. They are the only ones that can ask me to resign. It's not up to me. It's not my decision. It's not the city council's decision. It's not the governor's decision. It's the people's decision. They elected me. I've done the people's work. They're the ones that are getting a result uh, every single day, whether it's the, the fact that they like that they don't have to buy the bags anymore, or they don't have to pay the trash fee, whether they like that they have more public safety, or more education. So it's up to them. So you have to ask the people that question. And we're going to ask the people that question on March 12th. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, that's exactly how, how I think it should be. All right, fair enough. Now let's get into why people should, if the first part of the ballot recalls you, why you should be elected for to continue to serve as mayor. Pay as you throw, that's been the big issue for Fall River for a number of yep. years prior to you getting elected. That's right. Uh, you eliminated the contract with Waste Zero uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, you had originally included uh, this to be eliminated by the city council, the ordinance, Correct. back in June. You could have eliminated the contract back then. Why didn't you and why did you do it now? Yeah, so a couple things to that. So if you look at my, uh, my history uh, as the mayor, when I proposed to get rid of the $120 trash fee uh, nearly three years ago, I did it in support of the council. My budget was presented. The council eliminated the ordinance. And that is the, the way that they did it in cooperation with me. I have given this city council two opportunities, two opportunities to do it cooperatively mm -hmm. with me so that they can together show the public that, yes, we do not want the purple bags. Some of them even ran on eliminating the purple bags. I gave them two chances to do it. They said they wouldn't do it. In fact, they held me hostage. They held the citizens hostage by saying, we will not approve your budget if you take out the purple bags, right? This was the last budget. Mm -hmm. uh, and we would go to a 112 budget and potentially have layoffs. So we put it in, 
We didn't use any of that revenue to balance the budget. And what we've done now is said, you know what? We know that our revenue projections are correct. We don't need the revenue anymore. And we're turning it sa the savings to the taxpayers. Some people call it political. I am a politician. We all are that are running for office. Mm -hmm. uh, if there's a good thing that I can do that the, the, the city gains, mm -hmm. then why wouldn't I do it, no matter when? So now, and going forward, every single citizen in the city of Fall River does not have to buy purple bags, and that's a good thing for everyone, no matter how you split it. What's also important to remember is that prior to me being the mayor, you had mayors holding city councilors hostage. And what do I mean by that? They came down to the city council, uh, you know, budget time, would come around and they'd say, okay, if you don't give me these purple bags, if you don't give me this $120 fee, I'm gonna lay off 20 police officers, 30 pl uh, firefighters, I'm gonna send out pink slips to the, to the school department. That's the way it used to be. Today you have the total opposite. I go to the city council asking them to return money to the taxpayers, and they say, oh no, no, don't do that. You know, while I'm still providing more services. Mm -hmm. It's not, a, it's not a, uh, a one sided argument where I'm saying we're getting rid of fees and taxes or anything like this, and I'm laying off cops and, and firefighters. That's not what's happening. Right. It's quite the opposite. We're returning mo money to the public while increasing services. So I think it's a totally different scenario where even my own opponents, for the first time ever, are able to say, well, I want to do more and more and more. Right. But you don't have a track record of doing that. Mm -hmm. I do. They don't. Now, in terms of uh, trash uh, disposal, um, there will be some people who opted to get their own private trash mm -hmm. picked up that may be coming back now that they don't have to pay, if you will, for trash pickup. Is the city prepared for that, not only in terms of the increase in the amount of trash that it collects, mm -hmm. but also things like the bins, right? right? City residents get bins. Those who had private haulers mm -hmm. didn't have those bins. Are we prepared for that? So, so I'll answer that in a couple ways. Number one, we did that before, right? We've mm -hmm. collected everybody's trash in the city of Florida for a number of years, and we'll do that again. Uh, but it is a first come, first serve. If you left our system, our mm -hmm. program, and we don't have a bin for you, then you are gonna have to wait till those bins come in. Okay. Uh, but we are prepared, and we have many, many bins out there. So if anybody's watching at home, and they don't have a bin, call DCM, call my office, 508-324-2600. We'll get you a bin. All right, sounds good. Now, you mentioned in your press conference when you uh, announced the elimination of pay-as-you-throw that city's finances are, are very good moving forward. The reason why, you got rid of the, the pay-as-you-throw program. Um, how does fiscal year 2020 look in terms of, uh, you mentioned that people are saving money by not buying the bags. Is there an anticipation that taxes will go up for 2020? Mm -hmm. And in effect, people, their bottom line, they may not see as much of a savings if their taxes go up, say, two, two and a half percent? So, Keith, for the last 20 years, taxes have gone up by the maximum of two and a half percent. Would you agree with that? I would think overall, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so overall, okay. So taxes have been going up, and other mayors, former mayors, have been adding fees while taxes go up. I'm the first mayor in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to eliminate two fees. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's not fair to the, to the process and to the taxpayers to say, well, but your taxes are going up. Your taxes go up in every single community in the Commonwealth, and you get more fees and more fees. So what I've done is I said, okay, let's take a look at this budget. Let's be more fiscally responsible. Let's still add services while responsibly getting rid of fees that are inconvenient fees, that are user fees. What do I mean by that? The $120 fee was a user fee. The purple bags was a user fee. I'm not a fan of user fees. I think that if you pay your taxes, your taxes should encompass city services. We're not going to ask you to pay a public service tax, a public safety tax. Mm -hmm. We're not going to ask you to pay an educational tax. We're not going to ask you to pay a pothole tax or pothole fee. Those are all part of your taxes. So trash services should be part of your taxes, and that's what we've done. Now, I am the only candidate with a proven track record that when I say that I'm going to do something, I get it done. So I'll make another commitment. I am committed to eliminating and looking at how we stabilize taxes so they don't have to go up every year at 2.5%. I'm looking at other fees that we can eliminate. How do we do that? That's the natural next question. Right. Well, the answer is you have to replace that revenue somehow. That can be state aid, like, it, like it's happening in 2020 around education, but that can also be billboard revenue that we've proposed and that we're getting approved by the state. That can be marijuana revenue, which we'll, we will be receiving. That can be all kinds of other fees that we do not go after the taxpayer's pocket, but rather businesses that are, are creating new products like ma marijuana in our city or all these other avenues. And it's also tightening our belts and making sure we're spending efficiently and effectively. That's what we've continued to do. So no matter who the candidates are, I am the only candidate with the track record of giving taxpayers money back. Some of my opponents have voted for budgets that increase taxes. They voted for water rates that have increased. They voted for all these different things that have gone up, up, and up. 
and others have said, oh yeah, we need more money for schools, we need more money for this, but then they have no solutions as to where that money comes from. And the only one with a proven track record to continue to increase services while at the same time giving money back to the taxpayers. All right, let's shift to public safety. Sure. Uh, you've mentioned that you've, uh, again, facts, you've increased staffing levels at both mm -hmm. the fire department and the police department. Facilities and equipment have been improved. What's your plan going forward, short term and maybe in the next couple of years, to continue that trend? Yeah, so our fire department's probably not going to need an upgrade in their, in their fire trucks for at least 15, 20 years. Right. Uh, they're all brand new trucks, so we're really happy about that. The key is, and they love them, they really do, they take a lot of pride in those trucks, is to maintain those trucks, clean them, make, them, make sure that they're being maintained. That's very important. Uh, but in terms of, of the long-term and short-term needs, so there's still a lot of fire stations that need to be replaced uh, or upgraded, roofs throughout our community, uh, very, very important. Uh, what are we looking at in public safety? It may be time to look at a second um, substation for our police department somewhere else in the community. That's something that we, uh, we think about all the time. We have our capital plan, uh, a five-year capital plan that we've released to our city council. That capital plan basically over the next um, you know, five years and beyond in terms of debt service will fully upgrade all of our capital needs, building needs to maintain them for the future generations of our city. Uh, that's really what we've been doing. You know, that's the plan. But I think the plan is not, is not one of uh, you know, any surprises. It's keep progress moving, keep doing my job, keep just like the Patriots, do your job. That's how I feel, right? I show up to work and it's like, all right, we've got Belichick, we've got Kraft, we've got uh, our Tom Brady's, they're all our city employees, right? And we've gotta, we've gotta, we've gotta do it. We've gotta get a touchdown every single day. And that is how we've run our city of Fall River uh, by doing our jobs. And I can wanna ask the people to keep, to, to allow me to keep doing my job. And I'm really happy about that. Some quality of life is issues. Um, you have uh, launched the streetscapes program. Sure. You're continuing to fix roads and sidewalks in, in, in the city. Um, how does that play into, you know, improving people's lives in terms of what they see, right? Sure. People drive on our streets, right. they, they hear the bumps. I'm sure you get the calls all the time about potholes. Yep. Uh, what's your plan in terms of those types of quality of life? Yeah, so, you know, I've said it many times, my work's not done. Uh, you know, there are people out there whose streets still needs to be repaved or potholes that still need to be fixed. But each and every day we're doing those things. We have filled more potholes than the last, um, last few administrations. We know that factually because we have the stats to back it up. Uh, we also pay our pothole claims. It wasn't just a few years ago mm -hmm. that you would put in a claim if your tire got messed up by a pothole and you get that claim denied. Now we pay those pothole claims unless there's something uh, outlandish about the situation. Uh, so we've done those quality of life initiatives. The streetscapes, I'm really proud of because it was again cooperative with the city council. They approved it. Uh, and we targeted neighborhoods that, number one, were in census tracts uh, of a little bit more um, low to moderate income housing areas. Uh, and we also targeted places that had a lot of businesses, East Main Street, Purchase Street, Bank Street, Bedford Street, uh, Columbia Street even, uh, some really great businesses. And we doubled down on those businesses and said, no, the city cares about your neighborhood. We want to fully upgrade it with better parking, better lighting, trees, how important trees are in neighborhoods and they really give the, the community more character. They make you feel safer, it looks better, it's a beautification effort. And we're really proud of that because when you look at other communities, you look at some parts of Boston or Providence, or even a city more like us, like New Bedford, and you go to their waterfront or their downtown, you see streetscapes. Some are older than ours, uh, ours are still relatively new, but you feel a sense of place. And that's why the streetscapes are so important and increase the quality of life. You see what we've done around parks. I've upgraded six parks, Griffin Park and six other parks, uh, we had Patriots Playground put into Maplewood Park. We've done a million dollars worth of sidewalks in three years. It's a lot of sidewalk repair. We've increased uh, uh, you know, major projects like the uh, William Canning Boulevard, where I still today drive over that, that road on William S. Canning Boulevard next to South Coast Marketplace, mm -hmm. and it's a bumpy ride, but what are we doing about it? We got a $1.7 million grant from MassWorks to replace the entire road and put new lighting and crosswalks in, which currently don't exist there, increasing the safety of pedestrians. We have the Quickishan River Rail Trail, and we're doing more rail trails throughout the community. We have done so much for quality of life, um, and I'm really proud of that. You look at our waterfront, what we're doing with the city pier. You look at just the, the fact that housing prices are going through the roof in Fall River. Mm -hmm. Now, that's something that we've also looked at and said, okay, what are we doing about making sure that people can still afford to live in Fall River? We've done that responsibly. Right. Uh, we, have, we all know that we've had an increase in low-income housing come to Fall River over 30 years. But that doesn't mean that you know, we don't have people here that need uh, assistance on their, for their housing. So we've responsibly taken care of the assistance we have here and the assistance we need here 
while stopping the flow from other parts of our country and our state of low-income housing into our community. Uh, those are things that we've all done. And all of that stuff, whether it's economic development, education, public safety, quality of life, are all uh, are part of the package. Mm -hmm. If you're doing something in all those areas, you're going to see the results. And I think that's why people look at this administration over the last three years, and it's not magic, even though sometimes it seems like it is. It's good fiscal policy. It's really great teams. It's not personal agendas or somebody getting ahead within the administration. It's, uh, it's really a focus on every single day, the family, the business owner, the citizen, the renter, the taxpayer in our community. Mm -hmm. That's why I do this job. I love going to this job and, and trying to find a solution to a problem nobody else has been able to solve, mm -hmm. whether it was last year or 10 years ago. That's the excitement that I get from this job, and that's why I put on this suit every day or another suit <laughs> and go to the office and, and get this going. I'm running against myself. I want to outdo myself. Right. I want to see what the next fee is that I can eliminate. You know, that's what's exciting about this job. Let's talk about economic development and job growth sure. within the city. Um, I it's well known that um, you severed the city's agreement with an or the redevelopment authority as well with the former FROED, now BCEDC. Uh, the city is doing its own economic development uh, yeah. process moving forward. I know there's still a process to hire an eco economic development director. What's the process of that search? Mm -hmm. and, and some will question, and I'll ask, why wasn't that sort of put in place first so that it appears that a transition would have been a little smoother? I'll tell you very simply. You asked the question, so I'll answer it directly. I was fighting the establishment on this issue, okay? The establishment, the old boy network, the old guard of the city of Fall River. I had to fight that fight. I had to get over that wall to get to where we are today. And that was a tough fight. Mm -hmm. That was not easy. But somebody needed to do it, and it was this mayor. Because I believe in economic development for the many, not for the few. I believe in making sure that everybody has an economic development opportunity within the city of Fall River, and that's where we are today. We strengthened our redevelopment authority. They have the responsibility of the biotechnology park, the city pier, the two urban redevelopment plans, both in, in the waterfront and in our downtown. Uh, and that's where we're headed in the, in the near future. So we're searching for somebody to head up the, um, the RDA. Uh, we have some really, really great candidates. It's a lot of back and forth on who is the right person uh, because it's such an important job. Uh, but I think we're going to be there very, very shortly. But that doesn't mean that the mayor's office stops economic development. Mm -hmm. Wh this is what I find so strange about this conversation, that one person controlled all of the economic future of the city of Fall River. Economic development policy starts in the mayor's office, nowhere else, not in the boardrooms of some business owner in Fall River, not in the boardrooms of somebody that owns media companies in the city of Fall River. It starts in the mayor's office, and that's what we've done. So what do we mean by that? Well, we are poised to be a major player in the wind energy in industry. That's where we're poised to be. How are we doing that? We're looking at the Taunton River. We're identifying several parcels that make the most sense for these huge cable companies and wind turbine companies to come and locate in Fall River. Pre-permitted, ready to go, dockside uh, to, the, to the, you know, the, the Taunton River, 22 nautical miles from the proposed project Vineyard Wind uh, with rail. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. Even New Bedford and Brayton Point over in Somerset don't have rail on those sites. Right. We've got the opportunity to create thousands of new jobs in the wind energy industry. High paying jobs. Jobs that uh, a kid that goes to Diamond and learns how to weld can get and can make $100,000 a year. That's, a, cr and that's a, a life changing opportunity that has never existed. That's real economic development. That's how you change a city and that's what we're poised to do today. How about focusing on the businesses who are here? Many sure. of them been here, small businesses, larger businesses, been here for decades. Um, how do you plan to help them continue to strive and, and grow? Within well, not just, we've done that. So streetscapes, right? right? When you go and talk to a business, Tequila Line uh, uh, in, on Purchase Street, or uh, Europa Bakery on Columbia Street, or a business on East Main Street, um, Standard Pharmacy, for example, and you ask them, hey, um, you know, what do you think about the neighborhood? They tell you, well, you know, I wish the neighborhood was safer. I wish there was better lighting. I wish there were trees. We've done that. So we've supported our small businesses by listening to them and saying, okay, we're going to invest money in your neighborhood. You look at North and South Main Street, North and South Main Street has pretty much had a streetscape forever. Mm -hmm. But those other parts of our community, East Main, uh, Bank Street, Purchase Street, they haven't. So that's what we're doing. That's one way. We have our, our sign improvement grant. Uh, we have our business grant program. Uh, we do those things for our small businesses. You can come in and you want an, a, an, an awning, you want a new sign, we can match some of that money to, to actually get you a new sign. So we've been supporting small businesses in that way. And we're going to continue to do that. But what do small businesses want? They want safe neighborhoods. They want good lighting. They want good parking. And that's what we've been doing for them. So 
I think we, uh, we really have supported small businesses, the backbone of our, of our city, uh, and I'm really thrilled about that. I go to a small business, probably two or three every single day, and I love seeing these business owners that have been working their lives to achieve some success here in our city. Opioid crisis in the city, it's sure. not just a city issue, obviously it's a nationwide issue. Uh, the city has an, the Opioid Task Force mm -hmm. that has been established. What else can a mayor do to, to foster the, or improve the conversation in terms of prevention and to help people uh, get less addicted? Yeah, this is an issue that, that touches my heart, of course, and so many of our families and friends in our community uh, and in, uh, in the whole nation. So what did we do? Well, first and foremost, we hired one of the best law firms, uh, the law firm that was successful in suing the big tobacco companies mm -hmm. uh, way back when to go after the, the big giant uh, prescription drug companies. And that lawsuit may not be settled next year or even in five, five years, but when it is, we expect to get a chunk of that money. And some of those billions of dollars will flow to our city to do even more prevention, even more programming to save future, future lives. And I really think the prescription drugs, uh, drug companies have a big role in, uh, in the opiate e epidemic. We've also created programs to attack drug trafficking, working with border, um, you know, our border, our, our state border, a lot of the drugs that come into Fall River are coming from Providence, are coming from Rhode Island, up from New York. So we've worked with the police departments there and our police department uh, combined. Uh, we've done so much with the Opiate Task Force. Uh, we've have, we have all these members of different neighborhood organizations and different uh, nonprofits coming together to talk about strategies and ways to get people a bed in their time of need. We opened up Government Center, third Thursday of every month. Uh, no questions asked, you can come in for a family member or yourself, go to different booths that can help you. Uh, with a bed that day right now don't have to wait which was one of the biggest problems so i heard that was a big problem uh, when i first became mayor people would say hey you know my son or daughter was ready to go to treatment and i called up such and such organization and they didn't have a bed right that was their their problem so we tried to solve that with this uh this thursday um, uh, group that we have at government center and we've made an impact so much of an impact that opiate related incidents are down 12 percent do we have a long way to go? Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. Do we need everybody to help us with this problem? Yes, we do. But we're making an impact each and every day. Are you in favor of the second star facility on Weaver Street for that's, more, more beds? That's an excellent question. So I am working with Nancy Paul over at Star and the board members to see how do we take the methadone component and look at that very differently. How do we remove it from that facility? I'm not against building a new facility that's going to have, you know, doctors and health care providers in the building. I'm not against a facility that is going to encourage um, you know, high paying jobs and also treating and helping people within our community and even from outside our community. But I think the fear for that particular facility is the methadone component. So if we can look at that component and say, hey, we don't need methadone at this facility. Mm -hmm. We can do other programming at this facility. Mm -hmm. Then I think it's worth a shot and it's worth looking at. But as you see, this is the administration that denied them the building permit mm -hmm. to build a facility right. because we did not feel that they had risen to the level that they needed to, to, to meet uh, to do that facility. So we're watching it, we're working with them, and I will never shut the door on treatment or, or, um, or an economic development opportunity for more jobs. However, you gotta listen to the public. Mm -hmm. And if the public doesn't want a methadone component there, I've gotta do my job and relay that information to STAR and try and come up with a compromise. As mayor and also as chairman of the school committee, um, you've committed to increasing the city's minimum net school spending in terms of education. Uh, do you continue to hope to continue <laughs> that practice? And, and just above and beyond that, what are, are some of the things that you've learned in your role with the school committee in terms of the operation of the school department? Sure. Uh, maybe even your thoughts on the uh, performance by our superintendent, and how do you look to improve education? Yeah, so Superintendent Malone and I have a great relationship. I think he's done a fantastic job of motivating our teachers, motivating our school system, and raising the morale, which is really important. Uh, from the financial standpoint, many of the things that are made possible on the school department side, the improvements you've seen, are only the result of the city's financial position today under this administration. Uh, one of the things that I think we as a community have to start to get away from is the 100% the or 101 or 102% of net school spending as the, the be all end all. Right. You know, we in, in the beginning strive to exceed net school spending because it was a morale boost. Mm -hmm. It was a self-confidence factor. Now we have to get away from the percentage and talk about actual dollars being spent on education, actual increase in dollars. So if you take my first budget in 17, fiscal year 17, we increased that spending by $3 million. We, we gave the school department $3 million more. The following year, an additional three, so we're up to six, right. spending year after year. And this upcoming budget, we're going to be providing a minimum of $6 million new dollars, as high as $9 million new dollars, double what I've spent 
in my entire tenure as mayor. So we have done more for our education system here in the city of Fall River, which was, I know, a Chamber of Commerce initiative, a business community initiative, and a city goal and dream for many, many years than any other administration in the last decade. Mm -hmm. I'm very proud of that, and we're going to continue to do that, especially when you'll see us building this new state-of-the-art Derby High School for the next generation of learners. That if we can connect economic development and education and say, these are the jobs that we need to train for for the next 10 years, we're going to have even greater success, and I'm really excited to be leading that initiative. Let me get to um, your meeting with people across the city and outside the city. Um, how have they, ha have you seen any change in their reaction to you, speaking with you mm -hmm. in terms of working with the city since last fall? Is that still, is that still, you're still getting these great relationships, building them going forward? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, right. in fact, there's been even more support in many areas. We have unbelievable citizens. You have to keep in mind, there are always people that are not going to vote for the mayor, mm -hmm. right? Even in the last two elections that I've won, even though I've won by 60 plus percent, there's still a significant amount of people that right. didn't vote for me. And that's just part of the part of the job. Absolutely. There are always going to be people that have their own ambition, that have their own personal vendettas and their own agendas. Those people, I'm not going to worry about because I don't work for them. I work for the citizens of Fall River who elect me to do a job. And that job is to give them more services and a savings in their pockets. And that's what I've done. Um, so whether it's on the state level, whether it's on the federal level, whether it's on the local level, we maintain the necessary relationships to get things done. In the last two months alone, you saw us receive more money from the federal government to star in the form of a grant. Uh, you saw us receive our Shannon grant for gang violence. Uh, you've seen us receive money from the governor's office. Uh, you've seen us see more grants under this administration. We used to say, Boston doesn't pay any attention to us. We used to say, the governor didn't have any relationship with the city of Fall River. No matter what, over the last three years, I think I've seen the governor, this governor, and this lieutenant governor, more times than any other governor ever in the state of Massachusetts. So we're the ones that have built that relationship, this administration, and we're going to continue to maintain that relationship. And uh, I think we've done a good job with that. Your relationship with the city council, uh, mm. people who watch city council meetings see that it's evident that there's some strife there mm. between some members of the city council and your administration over the past few years. How do you hope to, to hope and hopefully smooth that over? Because, I mean, you do have to work together to get yeah. things done. You're absolutely right. So I don't hope or plan to smooth anything over. I do my job, and they do their job. They are also elected by the public, not by me. They don't answer to me. They don't work for me. They were supposed to work with me in some form or fashion. So this is my take on that. If I propose a budget that eliminates purple bags, I've proven myself over two years to have a surplus each year, to put money away, which we had no money when I started. Now we have $7 million in surplus. And this council says, no, we're going to hold you and your administration hostage. We're going to say, we're not voting for this budget unless you keep purple bags, which we know is one of your campaign promises. What obligation do I have to want to work with them, to want to be friendly with them, to want to like them? None. Mm -hmm. Previous mayors held the council hostage. Previous mayors went down at the last minute and said, if you don't give me this, this $120 trash fee or you don't give me these purple bags, I'm laying off police and firefighters. I'm sending out pink slips. So you need to give me this. And city councils, I was one of them, right, under two different mayors, mm -hmm. were pushed against a wall and had unions, police and firefighters and, and teachers saying, pass this budget, pass this budget, give us those fees or layoffs. That's not a good position to be in. No. I have made it easy for this council. I have given them budget after budget that returns money to our taxpayers, that gives more money to police and fire, that gives more money to education. And every single turn, they have tried to put up roadblocks because of personal vendettas and personal agendas. I won't stand for it, and I know the public doesn't stand for it. And I hope that they can realize that going forward. Finally, last minute we have, how can people find out more information about Diego <laughs> Correa's campaign? Oh, geez. So, uh, well, hopefully they get to meet me. Uh, right. That's the best part. That's the best way. Uh, whether it's at the senior centers, whether it's the coffee shops, restaurants, the gym even. You know, I'm always being stopped at the gym. Uh, you know, uh, whether it's the treadmill or walking around, people want to talk to me, that's great. I love that. So that's one way. Uh, you can also visit our Facebook page. Uh, you can go to futurefallriver.com, which goes to our Facebook page. Okay. And just check out the photos. Just look at the, it's amazing. It, I was going back myself. You know, it's amazing all the activity that we've done, um, which is just such an amazing gift to me as the mayor of the city. And I just hope that people will continue to 
uh, have faith in me, support me, and reelect me on March 12th and vote no and against the recall on March 12th. Mayor, thank you for your time. Good thank luck. You, Keith. Go ahead, I appreciate it. Thanks, and thank you all for watching, and please make a point to vote on That's March right. 12th. <laughs>